Hello and welcome to the Divine Renovation Podcast, where we seek to inspire and equip you to move your parish from maintenance to mission. Today we're going to be joined by uh, a parishioner. We realized we hadn't brought a parishioner onto the podcast before, so we're going to, we've invited uh, Kate Pinto to join us in a little bit. And she's a relatively recent parishioner at St. Benedict Parish, and I think she's got some really interesting perspectives on what it's like to be at a parish like St. Benedict. Mm-hmm. Uh, now before we go down that path, though, Ron, tell me, uh, tell me what's been catching your attention in those last couple of weeks. You know, it's interesting, even this morning I went to the Men's Leadership Gym at at St. Benedict Parish, a bunch of men get together at 6.45 and do some really cool things, talk, small group and stuff like that. But what was fun is I haven't been in a little while and uh, the feedback I was getting from the podcast. So all these people listening to the podcast at the parish and really giving us comments and feedback, it was just, it was a lot of fun. It was really fun because I haven't been there, but they feel like they can see us and hear us when we do this. So it's, a, it's neat how many people are connecting to it. And in fact, in one of my coaching sessions yesterday in the Divine Renovation Network, one of the pastors, uh, we were thinking with the leadership team, how can they leverage this podcast to their parishioners? Because Mm. they're on this maintenance to mission journey. And so many things that we talk about are the same language, concepts, and heart that he has. And so I, I challenged them to say, how can you use this podcast to seed your culture change that you're seeking to implement. And they just got so excited about that concept. So I gave them homework. I said, guys, I want you to think Mm. about how can you realistically leverage this? Because the more people you get hearing this language, hearing our hearts, seeing what we're doing, the mistakes we make, how we address challenges, I think I said I said I think it's going to help you well, do what you're doing, and I think that's one of the things, right, Father James? Like we 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 do a great job of of equipping the leaders of those parishes, but those 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 leaders still have to both inspire and equip people in their pews. And I think the podcast is is one way. I, I don't know that it's it's the only. Yeah, though, I, right? I think a key thing. There's a number of things. We've got to shift the conversation. We've got mm-hmm. to change the conversation, and you know, having a uh, a common resource uh, that that yeah. can be right. You know. I, in the past, I did it by by getting books, you know, in the early years. Of <laughs> That's Benedict. right. Yeah, of Benedict course. Parish. I forgot like, about before that. Before yeah. Divine Renovation came out, uh, uh, <laughs> Father Tom and Mike had, had, publi- had published Re- Rebuilt. And for me, it was a brilliant book because it it, it gave a picture of, of, of what could be. It, it challenged the status quo. It kind of revealed the underlying consumer culture that drives a lot of parishes and it gave a kind of behind the, the scenes look at the struggles mm. of leading a parish in that's a what i loved about and it i wanted our parishioners to see it so we actually bought three four hundred copies of the book yes and uh father michael if you're listening we're going to be looking for a cut of that it was fantastic because people read the book they pass it on to each other but we had to buy a book and we had to get them shipped in we had to distribute them and uh, with the podcast, you have, I'm not saying it's as good as the, as the book, but it is a resource that is, is you can multiply it. There's no, there's no cost to Just it. Just for the record, I think I'll have a book out in September, and I'd rather they bought the book. <laughs> <laughs> in September. In September. <laughs> Besides changing the conversation, also, it's about vision, isn't it? You know, mm. and, and one of our greatest struggles in parish life is our inability to imagine a different way of being. And it's an imagination problem. Mm-hmm. And imagination is always connected with, with dreaming, your ability mm-hmm. to dream. And when you're talking about dreams, you're talking about vision. Yes, and so well we, need to, we need to reframe. We always say that if you're going to think outside the box, you've got to get outside the box. And how can you get outside of the box but stay in your parish? Right. By being exposed to things. And hopefully our mm-hmm. podcasts can do that, as you said, to inspire and equip. Yeah, well, one of the things that we I, I run into too is we work so intensely with the leaders, to your point, within the Divine Renovation Network for those that are in it. And sometimes they feel the gap between what they're living, breathing, speaking, and what's happening in the pews. Yeah. And they don't know how to bridge that gap. And this is, can be just another tool to spark conversations, to get people dreaming and debating and, and excited about what God's really doing. God's doing an amazing work in the midst of so much struggle, like worldwide, it seems that the church is struggling. Mm. But I'll tell you, God is not done with us, and the Holy Spirit will rise. I think too, and do you, something Ron, you've cool. mentioned the Divine Renovation Network, which which is our coaching network, and it's a real a bit of a deep dive with parishes. But there are also many other ways in which parishes are connected to us, or even not necessarily connected to us, but but trying to to work cooperate with the grace of God to move their parishes to mission and. You know, this this tool, I think, this idea of using the podcast in this way, I, I 
I never actually thought of it. It's kind of neat, isn't it? It's not, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Listen, I get something else that I wanted to ask you, Dan, and that is the, the Divine Renovation Association. Especially <laughs> like we've had that, you particularly have had that as a vision. Of, you, you've always believed that that would be a tool that would be a blessing to some people who maybe couldn't afford or didn't see you know yeah. the, the network itself tell us a little bit well, here's what that. we know right like, here's what we know ever since divine renovation as a ministry started uh, there's been so much demand like we, we haven't been able to keep up with it there's so many and this, it's, it's a beautiful beautiful problem right because what we're, we're seeing are these pastors and these leaders all over the world who are waking up to a desire to do things differently and they, they don't know exactly what to do and they might if, if they're wise they might have bought your book they might have bought father michael's book they might have bought but they, they're still not equipped enough right and so one of the things they are reach, we ever? Uh, well, are we ever? Good point. <laughs> and so one of the things that I think we've encountered over those last couple of years is, well, how can we help? Uh, we, uh, we've got a desire to, to do everything we can to help equip these pastors, these leaders who've got a heart, who the Holy Spirit's called into to a different style of leadership. But there's only a limited amount of people we can help. And so like we, we've got, uh, you know, our goal this year, I think, is to get our, our coaching network up to about 50 parishes around the world. Um, and we're... The demand is, is going to exceed that. There's no question. But we've got we're, we're very careful about how we bring parishes in, and we're also careful about who we uh, who we encourage or, or equip to coach those parishes. And so there's a limit to how many parishes we can help. And when we're talking about thousands of parishes around the world, uh, the best way I thought was like we got to create something that's scalable. And so that's what the association that was the idea behind it, right? Can we create a resource that's scalable that can at least help some of those parishes out there that are, are you know phoning us and want to be equipped? And so it's a video resource. At the end of the day, largely it's an opportunity to. To, to plug into a, a series of videos done by our coaches. And so they're pre-recorded. And so the big difference is if you're in our coaching network, we're giving you one-on-one -on -one coaching. You're meeting with us every couple of weeks. If you're in our association, uh, you're, you're joining a sort of a, a website that's that provides you with all sorts of video resources of pre-recorded coaching sessions with our coaches. So it's it's one way I hope that some parishes will choose to, to become equipped. And they're relatively short, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. Some are very short. There are some that are a little longer, but most are like, you know, five, six, eight minutes. But they coach into key concepts, right? Mm -hmm. Key concepts that, that people are struggling with. It was with. just launched this week. And Father James, you uh, you with Nathan did an amazing video, just kind of teeing yeah, it up. Yeah, I'm wondering, Ron, that's, that's a great point. And I think, I think we can actually watch that right now. Over the last number of years at St. Benedict Parish and Divine Renovation, we were overwhelmed by requests and questions about different aspects of parish renewal. And we've been struggling with how do we meet that demand? How do we do it in the best way possible to equip you? The Divine Renovation Association was created for you by people who are doing it in real life parishes, resources that will help equip you and your team to move your parish from maintenance to mission. And this is the origin of the Divine Renovation Association, whether it's the monthly webinars, the live webinars with myself or other members of our team. Joe, there's so many cool things that you did to connect people post-Alpha. Week six or seven, you're, you're starting to count count the weeks and say, wait a second, this is gonna end at some point, and uh, I don't want it to end. The video resources you can use for small groups, really stories that draw out the essential nature of the vocation of a grandparent in the world and in the church today, or the multiple modules of short videos doing a deep dive into specific questions around parish renewal. Let's start being even more intentional about providing radical hospitality wherever we go. And may it start with you doing this role in your connect group the next time you do it. It can help us to help you. The Divine Renovation Association can help equip you and your team with key information and knowledge and get you connected in with other people who are passionate about parish renewal, just as you are. We believe that it's an excellent tool to help equip you and your team to lead your parish from maintenance to mission. The, the key thing about the the DRA is that it's it's a living thing. It's it's going to we hope to constantly add to it. There are three main components. There is a monthly live webinar that you can come on, and there's a leadership theme, some theme of parish renewal, and there's live interaction you can watch with your team. You can in fact watch with as many people as possible. We're doing uh, well, 
Anyway, so yeah. there's that part. <laughs> and it's exciting. Uh, it's exciting. And then there is a series of, of discipleship resources that we created a number of years ago. So they're up there for unlimited use. You, you can run it, you know, make it available to as many parishioners as you want. They can run small groups in homes and such. And there, is the, there are the modules that are deep dives into, into aspects. And one of the first ones that's up there, Ron, you did, a, I think, a 29 session or 28 sessions. 28 videos, on, yeah, 28 uh, videos. Videos on how to maximize alpha. And it really is, I've never seen anything quite like it uh, because it comes out of your incredible experience in running alpha in several different parishes and the things you've learned. And, mm. and I think it's a fantastic resource. So it's going to be... Uh, a living thing, and we hope it's of value to people. Yeah. So you know spread so, the word, yeah. sign up. And you know what's cool about that too, and again, just sharing with some people, is that so many churches are limited in their pastoral staff, right? That's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you have any pastoral staff, that's uncommon. <laughs> and so, you know, when you're trying to put on programs like Alpha to help change your culture and stuff, every t person you have to train, every time you have to have a conversation, it chews up your time. And if you don't have a lot of resources in terms of people, then that means you don't have a lot of time. And so a lot of times people go under supported. Mm -hmm. And these video resources actually free you up. You know, it's the same there message. Videos, as, Ron, you've got one. Like if you're if you're the MC at Alpha, there's Ron is like Ron oh, the coaches you on how to do it. Yeah. You're, you're the MC. Congratulations. Uh, let's let's talk about your role. And it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's incredibly helpful. Yeah, so it's fun. It's fun. It's fun continuing to innovate with you guys and the team, watching what you know, trying to answer the call to your point, Dan. What we feel God's calling us to do, to just to be a blessing and share our mistakes and some of the things that we're doing that are working okay, and and hopefully start the conversations that help people lead better because it, yeah. it's just so much fun to do that. Um, one of the other things I wanted to share with you, which I thought was cool, the other day I talked to a priest and he said something. I, so beautiful. He said he had an appointment coming up with his uh, bishop, and he was excited to go to that uh, meeting and to hear what the bishop was had on his mind. But I said, "What do you? What? What? What is on your heart?" And he said, "I want the bishop to know that in my thirty plus years of being a priest, I've never been involved in a church that's bearing as much fruit as we are right now." And just to hear his excitement, he just was so excited. He just wants the bishop to know that this is working. He said, let me give you an example. He said, we were just, we just had a senior leadership team meeting him and his, his staff, and they were talking about some of the initiatives they're feeling called to branch out into. And of course, all those initiatives require what? Leadership leaders and like everybody else they're limited and stuff so they started thinking well, who would be good at that and right away they're coming up with the same names and they know these people are going to say yes he said ron we didn't have any leaders a year ago <laughs> and now we're instantly thinking of all these people that are being raised up because their hearts are being transformed by jesus christ's love through the power of the holy spirit predominantly through their continued efforts with alpha and it's changing everything they do. And he said, I just want the bishop to know all these cool things. And, you know, again, in 38 years, he's never been more excited about being a priest. Isn't that cool? Like, that just makes my day. <laughs> it's, yeah, it is something, isn't it? Because, I mean, so many of the, the, the pastors out there feel like they don't have leaders in their pews. But the, the reality is they're, they're flush with them. They just haven't been able to connect the, them. And, and that itself is, is, is a... A function of leadership as well. I mean, the, 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 one of the things that leadership does is it unleashes other gifts, and mm -hmm. and sometimes we have this scarce this scarcity mindset that that we don't have resources. I mean, our resources are there every single weekend in the pews, but but they're not unleashed. It's like yeah. fruit on a tree that's unpicked. Mm -hmm. It's not being harvested uh, for for the, for the kingdom of God, and I, I think that's that's tragic because every single parish. Uh, has the potential to impact his community if if the gifts that are in the people among the people of God are unleashed. Right. right, and that is a whole different vision. It's a whole different. It's a whole different understanding of what our purpose is as a church. Because if we believe our purpose is simply to do liturgy and sacraments, I think that's critically important. And it's way bigger than that. But and to minister to the lay. There's, there's two models, yeah. you know, uh, in that the traditional. Clerical model was that the that, that ministry is the is the job of the paid clergy person, and so the laity pretty much you know outside of you know they the, the come to church one hour a week, but 
the 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 basic posture is I am minister. I receive ministry by you, whereas you know Ephesians chapter four, Saint Paul, in talking about the role of the pastor and other other charisms, says it's to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the church. Two very different models. That is the role of the of the pastor to do the work of ministry to the saints or to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. These are two very, very different things. Well, and it's interesting because sometimes when people get that, if they get that, then it's like, hey, I'm not doing it, you do it. So we tell them what to do, but that's not equipping people either. Yeah. We didn't just tell people what, that's not equipping anybody, mm. that's just dumping the responsibility on somebody else. What does it mean to, to get to know, to invest in, and to raise up people based on their call? That is a skill set that priests must begin to wrap their heads around and surround themselves by other people who can do it. Because guess what? It is not going to happen by itself. And until it does, your church is going to keep dying. Well, we, we were never trained in that model of ministry. We are primarily trained in a, in a shepherding and teaching model that we are we are the shepherds. And so it, that, that, that idea of, the, of the, 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 the clergy person who does all the work in ministry, that's actually reinforced uh, by our theology at times. Not all of our theology, by some of it. And also by the by the the formation model, the the, the, the seminary model affirms this the, 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 this idea that that my job is to serve the needs or meet the needs of my parishioners, not to raise them up. And here's the irony: we're called father. Hmm. You're both fathers, and what is the there is a when your children are really really young, you have to meet all their needs yeah. or some of them, mo most of their needs. Hot dogs. But the, Hot dogs. the ultimate goal of fatherhood <laughs> is to is to eventually fail in that first definition, mm -hmm. is to get your children where you don't have to meet, their, meet needs their needs anymore. anymore. In fact, if you continue to meet the needs of your children when they're growing, that's actually a, that's actually a travesty. They're going to be useless. That's a failure of, <laughs> of, of fatherhood. So you, you've, it's to bring people to maturity. And St. Paul says that. He says, for this I labor to present you all mature in Christ. Mm. Um, but we often have a culture of immaturity within our parishes. And what, what, I, and what I beg for, what I cry for, and I think the church is crying for is, we know what to do. We don't know how. We need models yeah. that are fruitful. And so, you know, when I think about this pastor who's never seen as much fruit as he's seen in this past year, in his whole life, I think to myself, the temptation for a bishop, my guess would be, wow, he's doing really good. I wonder what else we can give him. Or I wonder where we should move him next. Or I want as opposed to allowing that to be, be, become a model in your diocese for health, fruitfulness, and excellence, where that can become a training center that can bless your entire diocese, versus, oh, great, I think he can handle more. Let's lump a bunch of other stuff on him, and or, boy, let's pull him in a different direction. And so this whole idea of thinking beyond the current pain point to think long-term, because our problem isn't, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I would guess that you know, with the shortage of bishops and or sorry, priests and so forth, we're feeling the the pain of holes. But you know, we're not going to get vocations. We're not going to be able to go on mission if we don't grow faith. If we don't p bring people to a place of conversion and set their hearts on fire. And also, with if we the don't Holy have Spirit. models, healthy models of of priest leaders who are actually not running frantic, plugging holes, but actually doing something significant and exciting. Right. This is gonna inspire people. So true. I mean, who wants to, who would be attracted to the, the present rat race when the, the primary driving uh, value is, is let's keep the, this old defunct system running, up and running. Uh, at any cost. An, out, an outdated system at any cost, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to one of our, our partners down in the States, um, yesterday and uh anyways, he said something to me he's like you know because we're talking about like well what's what's divine renovation doing in the states and what where are the opportunities where, where we're seeing opportunities to to encourage and equip more parishes and uh anyways he's like well you guys know who all who all the the, the best leaders are the ones who who get this right they're all the early adopters and you, you know who they are i'm like actually no i don't think <laughs> i don't think we do i said my, my i think our experience to date has been that there are amazing pastors out there that are so busy right now that they know what they're doing isn't right they just don't know what they should be doing and they haven't yet encountered us or any of the other models of successful parish life and i said like even last week we had father james mckay on right there's a perfect example of exactly what i mean right there's a, a pastor who's got a passion for leadership he's got all the gifts but until he encountered that there was a way to do it differently he was he was he was struggling and i think that's the, that's probably exactly what's happening all over the place, all over the world. And so when I was speaking to him, I'm like, I, I don't think we've, I don't think our people out there, the people who have got the passion, I don't think they've found us yet. 
And I don't think they've found, a lot of them haven't found anything and they're just, they're just bearing the weight of it. Just for the record, I'm glad they haven't completely found us yet because we're, <laughs> we're growing as fast as we can. And yet, and yet you're right. I think there is a big need. And I think, you know, my, and my, that's my heart bleeds fat. Father James, you were sharing a story with, with us recently about one of your pastor cohorts and kind of the you know, leading in this new model and how hard it can be. Why don't you share that with yeah, us? Yeah, one of the, usually what we try to do in the coaching session with pastors, which is a part of the Divine Renovation Network. So our pastors are in different cohorts and I meet with them once, once a month. And I usually try to have open-ended questions. So the two questions I had was, what is giving you the greatest joy right now in your ministry? And we went around and everyone shared that. And the next question was, what is the leadership challenge that you're postponing or avoiding? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> and by leadership challenge, I mean uh, the th <clears throat> not the, the regular run of ministry, but the thing you have to do to, to move the thing forward, to move the thing from you know, closer down the road of maintenance to mission. And usually there are always challenges because oftentimes they're conversations, difficult conversations or crucial conversations that need to happen, which were the ones we're tempted to avoid, or their decisions that need to be made, tough decisions. Right. And things about a tough decision is is sometimes we're not clear for whether it's the right thing. So there's an element of risk invo involved. Yeah. And uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty. Yeah. And whenever you make a decision, you're going to make someone mad. Someone's going to be mad at you. And 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 so things like this, um, or a, a critical thing that you need to do, that you need to write, you need to sit down and find time to, to put this down on paper. All of these are the kinds of things that we avoid and we put off. Sure. Mm. And so I asked that question. And what was interesting at the end, when, when guys had shared, I was able to say, you know, guys, I've, I, I raised this not because I'm somehow saying, you know, shame on you for avoiding things. <laughs> uh, we all avoid things, yeah. uh, sometimes for good reasons, for bad reasons. The, the, what's the good reason to avoid dealing with certain things? You can only do so much at a time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, if we were to try to tackle all of the, the, the leadership challenges at once, we would go insane. That's even if we didn't have to do things like, I don't know, Sunday masses, right. sacraments, funerals. Like, let's remember, like, like this is not a sprint. This, this, And the other thing, too, sometimes leaders can labor under this because there's a sense of, well, I'm now more aware. I see things I didn't see before. I didn't know so that true. these things were, were challenges. I was, I was, <laughs> I was, I was in Waking up bliss, it, yeah. blissful ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> blissful ignorance. Yeah. And now I see all these things. And there's a temptation to think that if I can just only deal with all the things I, I see that are on my radar, then I will move into this ut utopian oh. peace where there, there are no difficult difficulties, no I've challenges. I've <laughs> the truth is there, are nev there will never be a time in no. your leadership, never, ever, ever, where there will no not be pressing, looming leadership challenges that you have to deal with. That will never, never happen. Uh, so we've got to... Is that the good news be, or the bad news? <laughs> I, it could be both. It could be a certain one sense is bad news, but another sense is good news because it tells you you don't have to... Like, stop putting pressure on yourself that somehow you have to deal with all of these challenges at once. And the key thing about postponing or avoiding them, yeah. I mean, I said there's a good reason to because there's something called sanity. You only deal with so much. And sometimes it's timing. Sometimes it's not it's, an appropriate sometimes time. Sometimes it's timing. We can't deal with that now. So, and there's sometimes bad reasons to avoid them because we're afraid and such. But the key thing is not that we're avoiding these things. The key thing is that we know we're avoiding them, I think. And that there's an accountability place. I remember uh, in, when we were in senior leadership team, Ron, there was one particular crucial conversation that I was avoiding because I just didn't want you know, the energy to go, that I didn't mm. feel I had the energy. Or it wasn't going to be pleasant. I wasn't looking forward to it. But on the to-do list, it kept getting put up there <laughs> like week after week after week. So it was like, everyone knew I was about yeah. <laughs> I, I knew I was about Every, There was nowhere to hide. And, and, <laughs> and I remember you were really pushing me on this, that Father James, you can't, because I was like, well, I'm, I'm waiting for the perfect opportunity. No, uh, the, these are not things that you find time to do. They're always things you have to make time to do. Well said, yeah. well said. Well, you know, it, it's a lot of fun, this leadership concept and this transformation. But, you know, when you say, you know, sanity and all those other things, and it's never going to be a point where we're not dealing with issues and things like that, 
I, I couldn't agree more. And you know what I'm finding is that people are having the most fun they've ever had in hmm. their priesthood and their leadership because they're not doing it alone if you're working out of a senior leadership yep. team. And that pressure isn't on you as if you're the savior, yeah. right? As a pastor or a priest, you're not the savior. <laughs> well, one, one of our priests was be really being pressured by all these things. He was feeling it. And he said that, you know, that... Uh, there were messages on his voicemail from a senior leadership team saying, "We love you. We're praying for you. We're with you on this." And wow, what a what a difference to the feeling of being alone and carrying this stuff mm. by yourself. And by the way, obviously, there are challenges in the normal run of parish life, but these will be multiplied if you actually lean into leadership. If you actually try to move beyond the status quo and begin to change things, you know, as we've said before, people are fine with change until they feel it. Right. You know, when people begin to feel change, that's that's when that's when the fur flies and it gets very interesting. <laughs> and so, and so, the leadership. Let's be clear that the, the leadership claiming the role of leader that's rooted in ordination and in baptism, we're we're baptized as priest, prophet, king as well. There's it's a baptismal responsibility to to seek to live out your leadership potential, your potential as leadership, and that's influence, right? Um, anytime you lean into leadership, it, there's a suffering that is accompanied by it. There, there is a suffering. Um, so I heard a guy say one time in, in Moncton, he came and spoke at uh, a Toastmasters group that I belong to, a Christian Toastmasters group. Moncton is a city. Um, in New Brunswick. In New Brunswick, Canada. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds kind of funny without the context. But I remember he was giving a leadership talk and he said, as a leader, your first your primary responsibility is to do the, the right thing, not, you can't make your primary value being liked by everyone. Oh, yeah. hmm. He said, I would rather be trusted and not liked than liked and not trusted. And as a result, sometimes leadership can be lonely. Yes. And that's why leading out of a team is so important because if you are doing it by yourself, it's going to be lonely to the point of, probably bringing you in places you didn't want to go. You know, Ron, it's, it's, an, it's, it's so true. And I've in the past number of years, I've spoken a lot about how the system, our system uh, throughout the West, uh, anyway, the, what the Western church and, and that I include in Europe and North America, the, the structure that we have is there's a certain inhumanity to it. And in many ways, I've been an advocate for almost the rights of priests because I see priests that care, that haven't given up or being crushed between the expectations of the system, the unrelenting uh, system and the expectations from parishioners and, and the bishop and such, and the expectations they feel from God calling them to actually make a difference. And there's, a, there's, there's guys who are getting crushed in the middle. But over the last... 10 months, you know, working at the diocesan level, working with uh, my own bishop and talking to a lot of bishops whenever I travel, my eyes really have been opened that as inhumane as it is sometimes for priests, it's doubly so for bishops. Mm -hmm. And if senior leadership teams can bring a bit, bit of humanity to the leadership of priests, I also believe it can really, really work for bishops. So any uh, lay people or priests who are listening about this, I mean, speak to your bishop, encourage your bishop to, to move towards this model because that loneliness of leadership and that pain of being a place where there's leadership challenges, huh, they're being multiplied for bishops today and and it's they, they're very much alone in it. Uh, I'm going to stop us there, guys, just because I, I, I'm getting lonely. Yeah, and uh, I think it's. Uh, I think uh, uh, the thing is with the two of you guys, you know, we just turn the, turn on the, the mics and you guys can keep going. But I really want to get Kate up here and talk to her about her experience at St. Benedict. So why don't we take a short break and we'll bring Kate on? That's great. Kate, it is so great to have you join us today. Now, I, I, what we really want to talk to you about is your experience of being a St. Benedict parishioner. But before we talk about that, uh, why don't you give us a bit of your, your own story and maybe how you encountered Christ? Sure. So I was a university student and I was pretty far from God. I grew up in the Catholic Church. I was cradle Catholic. And um, I sort of got roped into this community theater outreach program. They were doing a production of The Sound of Music and they needed a postulant nun. Oh, were I you think, Maria? Uh, no, I, no, I wasn't oh. Maria. Look how I 
disappointed he is now. All right. All right. Our show's over. Uh, we obviously made a mistake. Uh. I wasn't Maria, um, but I was one of the, the in the nun chorus as a postulate nun. And it turned out, um, I found out very close to, to the, uh, the opening of our production that it was actually a Catholic church that was putting on this show. Hmm. And through that, became involved in youth ministry in that church. And from there, eventually. Oh, well, wait a minute! Oh, wait okay. a minute! That's quite a you know from uh, the from the nun choir. Yeah, I know. <laughs> youth ministry. Like, what happened? How did that happen? I'm really well, invited you. Well, uh, so do you want the whole story? Well, let's, oh, yeah, you know, let's oh, dig a little. <laughs> <laughs> so I originally, um, I guess, auditioned. I so I went to university for a music degree, and I wanted to study musical theater. And in the first few weeks of my degree, they declared that they were phasing out this program, and that I had to re um, uh, pick a new major, which would have been <laughs> classical voice, which wasn't what I wanted to go to university for in the beginning. So I was really angry, actually, and I was particularly yeah, I angry with God that He would lead me halfway across the country to a university yeah, what a guy, what guy that would do didn't that? even have the program <laughs> I wanted. And um, so that's uh, and. Then very soon after, I heard about these auditions for The Sound of Music um, and auditioned for the show and uh, actually didn't get the part that I auditioned for and decided I wasn't going to do the show. Um, but uh, the musical director happened to be another student in the School of Music, and I saw her every day after that. And um, and every day she'd say, you know, we still really need sopranos. We really need a, this particular postulant nun role we would really love to have you and uh and i kept saying no i'm not going to get involved in community theater i don't even have a lead part and i was very bitter <laughs> about I it. Important? yeah <laughs> yeah i was very bitter about it um but uh eventually i don't know why i think it was her persistence um in asking me uh to join that i finally one day i said yes fine i'll be there where when's rehearsal and I didn't even know it at that time that it was out of a Catholic church. Okay. And I was really far in my faith. I had fallen into the party scene that many university students fall into. And I was really angry with God at that time. And so it was through being a part of this production that I started to discover that God wasn't just something, someone that I could visit at church or that I went to when I was convenient for me, but that God was a part of my life and that Jesus was a part of everything that I did. How did you catch that? Was it yeah, so the community theater outreach program is called the St. Joseph Stage Prophets. Okay. And their their mission is to to sort of pray and make Christ the center of their productions. Whoa. Oh, um, well, that's a horse yeah. of a different color right there. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's and you, you didn't caught even up know. In. So that's sort of what I got caught yeah. up in. So I went in thinking I was doing the show and left realizing sort of like, whoa, this Jesus guy is pretty cool. <laughs> That's the best. That's yeah. amazing. Wow, what a wonderful yeah. mission you're, they you're have. on the Shout stage to you them. thought you were. I was not on the stage that I thought I was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, that exactly. Good. So from there, um, the director of the show eventually asked, she was the youth minister at the parish as well, and said, you know, we could really use some leaders in our for our youth group. Do you think you might be interested? And um What's her name? Mary Hanneman. Way to go, Mary Hanneman. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, she's awesome. And um, so, yeah, so Mary invited me to be a part of youth ministry uh, at St. Joseph's Church. And uh, it was through giving me leadership that I started to encounter Christ in a personal way slowly over time. Uh, and it sort of culminated, what's the name the word? Cumulated? Into, culminated. Culminated into this one moment um, I ended up going to World Youth Day yes. uh, in Brazil, uh, and I was on the beach with 3.5 million other Catholics oh, wow. with Pope Francis. You were there when, when Matt Marr sang, That's right. it was, Lord, I Need You? It was exactly in the next morning after that happened, oh. um, and I was on my knees on the beach uh, in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and I fully gave my life to Christ, and I said, Jesus, I want you to be at the center of my life. I want to live for you. And I give up any plans that I have for myself, and I really just trust in whatever path that you you put me on. Holy and smokes. And the word that I received immediately after, after doing that was this word missionary. And I had no idea what the heck that meant. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Like, okay, so like I just gave you my life, and I really, you know, yeah. missionary. Like, you want me to go to Africa? I, you right, know, that's what I most people think. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, you want me to go to Africa? Like, I didn't even know that that what this word missionary meant in, in the Catholic context. Sure. And so it was only uh, then, sorry, that I sort of 
not only encountered Jesus personally in that deep, intimate way for the first time, but also received a really strong call to live out my, my mis- missionary identity as, 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 as that I received at baptism, which is really beautiful. Um, yeah, very blessed. So uh, from there, so I... So you left the beach and what happened? I left, <laughs> the, beach, I left the beach and I called up um, my parish priest at the time who became my spiritual director. And I said, okay, so I'm supposed to be a missionary. I don't know what that means. You need to help me with this. This is <laughs> my, my fifth year of university. And I applied to a bunch of missions um, in various forms uh, across Canada and ended up working for Catholic Christian Outreach. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really struck by their mission. Catholic Christian Outreach is a university student movement dedicated to evangelization on university campuses. And I was really struck by the fact that if, if CCO had existed on my university, mm-hmm. my whole university career would have been so much different. Mm-hmm. And um, my encounter of Christ would have happened way sooner. And the only reason why CCO wasn't at my university is because they didn't have enough people to send to my university to be missionaries there. And I thought, man, I can make a difference here. So I started working for CCO um, then. And <laughs> yeah, I guess that's sort of like the beginning of my my faith journey into my, my Catholic missionary identity. I, lo- I love what you say about like, if they would have been, you know, if CCO would have been in a university when I went, it could have changed my life. And I just think about all the CCO missionaries out there now and wondering if you're making a difference and wondering, you know, if people, because sometimes you get rejected and, you're, you know, but it's worth it. There are people like you who are living, you know, at that time, living live the party and just seek, seeking meaning and purpose for life that need the good news. They need to come to know Jesus yeah. in a way. So for those CCO people out there and even those university students that are listening or watching, like, this stuff matters. Like connect with your local movements, and I know in the U.S. it's focus, isn't it? That's very similar to CCO. It's mm-hmm. so beautiful. Yeah. Cool. So, what types of ministries did you? So you got involved. You got engaged. What did your ministry look like? What did ministry start to look like for you as you lived that out? Um, I think for me, it was a huge culture change. Um, I went from being in. A sort of a more rural parish and a rural, my university was in a rural area, um, to being in a group of people who were so convicted by the gospel, who, you know, it was a bit overwhelming at first. <laughs> you guys right? gotta tone it down. Yeah, like, <laughs> it was a bit, it, it was a bit of a culture shock, um, but I just fell in love with it. I just, I, it really truly became like a family. Uh, working, working with those people, and being surrounded by so many people who were convicted of the same thing, and, mm-hmm. and I think that's what's so similar about being a, a parishioner at St. Benedict's Parish, is that um, not only are the leaders in the parish, you know, convicted of of being missionary disciples and and doing the best to to share Jesus with others, but they're also um, the, the parishioners, not just the leaders, but the parishioners are also sort of on board with this culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's that's the big difference that, that I, I've seen from from other parishes. Um, yeah. And I think it's a, it's a key point, Kate, because even within our baptismal identity, we, we say, okay, I feel a call to be, to be missionary, to be a missionary. And therefore that means I have to join this organization and almost in a sense... Uh, have it be my livelihood, which for some people, they do definitely have that calling. But that's not the primary meaning of mm-hmm. what a missionary disciple is. Totally. A missionary disciple is someone who lives out their baptism and they're out of a missionary identity in their workplace, in their normal work- workplace, and with everything that, that they do. And it doesn't mean that you have to you know, stop doing this and start doing that mm-hmm. in, yeah. t- in terms of an occupation or, or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, too, that's something I've discovered, you know, when I think back on where I was on that beach and understanding what missionary right, was yes, yeah. to even like a year after that to now. Um, absolutely. I think I, I have the privilege of working with um, – a student down at my my old university who's who runs Acadia University is the name of the university she runs Catholic Acadia there oh, cool. and it's so amazing um, to be able to work with her and to disciple her uh, and and to hear the glory stories of of what it's like for her on campus to be a student missionary and that's the language that mm. I use with her is is to be a student right. missionary right yeah. like how can I how can I live out my identify my missionary identity in my vocation as mm-hmm. a 
student That's or right. as a doctor or whatever that is. Mm-hmm. So, so Kate, uh, you've got you've been to a, a member of many parishes over over the years, I mm-hmm. assume, right? Uh, help me understand how you how you see Saint Benedict because you're newer to the community. Mm-hmm. So, help me understand the contrast between that experience and other parishes you've been a part of. How new? Yeah. So, I was married at July twenty second. Yeah. Yay! Yay! Um, and my my husband was. Uh, uh, a parishioner of St. Lawrence that eventually amalgamated to become St. Benedict. So he grew up in in the St. Benedict um, transformation, I guess you could say. Um, so I'm fairly new. I had not even a year of worth of being a parishioner yet. Uh, and I have had the privilege of being a part of many different parishes um, over, over the last few years. I think the biggest difference is that not only is St. Benedict's doing a lot of things right, but they're also aware that they have a long way to go in certain areas. And I think that um, St. Benedict's is, is is really good. And the people, for the most part, I mean, there's always the few that aren't, are pretty good at saying, you know what, we want to strive for excellence. Um, but, but where are we now and how can we make it more excellent? Mm. And what aren't we doing excellently? <laughs> what are we blowing? <laughs> how can we get better? Yeah, yeah. What are so? We how doing have you experienced it? Like, how have you come into contact with that kind of culture, that disposition, or that mindset? Yeah. Well, I, my, I guess the ministry that I'm most actively involved in is Laura's ministry with the, like the Kids Men, as she calls it, SPP Kids. Nice. Uh, and I work really closely with Shine, and uh, I think it's just her. She's so new too in the position, and she's so bold in 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 the decisions and the ideas that she's bringing to to the table. It's really beautiful to see and to be a part of. Um, and her question always is like, okay, how can we do this better? How can we like okay. how can we fix this problem? Okay, we got this problem. Mm. Let's try and solve it. Let's try it this way. Okay, that's not working. Okay, what if we try it this way? <laughs> right? And and that's exactly the mindset we want. That's yeah, what I we want in, in our in our parishioners and in our leaders <laughs> is to always be be striving for excellence. Yeah. It's wonderful when people feel like they're empowered to do that. Like she's a staff member, part of a team, and feels empowered to, and it's okay to make mistakes and try something different and experiment and keep going. And she's the one driving that ministry. And so blessed because I know she just finds you a godsend mm-hmm. in terms of somebody who she gets emotional and spiritual support from, as well as, the, you know, being there with her. And so, you know, it's wonderful, you being raised up a leader with her and her being able to continue to take that perspective and being a part of a staff culture where you're you're expected, empowered, enabled to do those types of things. I, it's, it's such a great question, because oftentimes there can be within parish cultures a sense of, you know, better why what are you what are you talking about that's not very spiritual uh <laughs> if you're very spiritual it doesn't matter if you're doing a spiritual thing it doesn't matter how well you do it because it's all up to god whether god is going to work or not mm-hmm. so that's you you need to you need to think carefully about your attitude you know and i i, I think that there's this tendency to to put into opposition uh quality uh how, in whichever way we define that with 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 our theology about how how God works, quantity th- too sometimes. Quantity sometimes as well. We back away from numbers, thinking that's not spiritual. Exa- exactly, and I think that's very very unfortunate. Uh, I, I think that that God wants us to do things well, and and besides, what does well mean? It well means I th- would think effective. How do we how do we reach people? How do we help people to encounter Jesus in a life changing way? Adults, children as well. And how do we see that fruit to see that, to help them understand themselves to be missionary disciples yeah. who, who will live for Christ in, in their ordinary lives? That, that's, what, that's the kind of people we want to raise up. That, that's, the, that's the goal. And, and those, in, those kids, some of them in the future, will go on to live fruitful lives as, as followers of Jesus. So asking how can we do that better... That's a vital question. I, but I think, too, it's an uncomfortable question as well. You know, and, and it goes back to that famous saying of, you know, we're not called for comfort, we're called for greatness. Mm. And uh, and I, yeah, isn't that awesome? That is it's so, so good. great. I just love it. <laughs> Say that again. That, that, <laughs> yeah, that you're not called for comfort, we're called for greatness. Is that a Kate Pinto quote? No, it's not a Kate Pinto quote. Is it Morgan maybe? No. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Maria? <laughs> that was that Mother course. Superior. Said that. <laughs> no, that was climb every, every mountain. mountain. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I just think too for for people who 
feel that way, I, I would really challenge that the perspective of, of like, okay, so yes, absolutely, we need to lean into the Lord because the Lord is who's going to make us great. But also he asks us to do uncomfortable things to help us grow in that great that great calling that we have. Mm. There's also another dynamic that in, in parishes, you see, there's two reasons to change what you do. Number one, it's not working. Number two, it is working. Right. So, now, sadly, you would be surprised. It's, <laughs> it's mind blowing to me how often in parishes we cling to things that are not working. Mm. They're, they're not working. Maybe they did work at some point, but they're not working. And yet we don't want to give it up because we reveal ourselves to be more attached to our method than, than, than our mission. And, or we say, well, let's just do it. Let's go back and do it again and be really sincere this time at doing the thing that doesn't work. And do it, it harder. Do it harder. <laughs> yeah. Let's commit even more resources to the thing that doesn't work. Yeah. So if it's not working, you, you, you need to change. But if it works, you'll eventually need to change it too. Because if it works, it's going to change the reality that you're working with. It's, yeah. it's going to grow. People are going to be at a different level. Uh, you're going to be presented with more challenges. And so eventually you have to you have to tweak it. You have to change it. And so I think that we've got to be constantly asking that very question. How can we do this better? And when we ask that question in terms of how we do things, everything's going to be on the table, even the, the things we, even maybe the things that we created ourselves or we thought up, you know, the things we're most proud of. Right. Biggest uh, accomplishments. If, if these yeah. become more important than the mission itself, that's when we get into trouble. Yeah, amen. And I think when we change too, like that's a good point because as things are successful, change, people grow. And how do we continue to grow people and remain open to new people? Because mm -hmm. it's so it's so natural to say, great, we got this wonderful people. And then you focus only on them. And then new people, all of a sudden there's a barrier and mm -hmm. we're not as open. So how do you experience that in kids ministry? Because you're working with a group of kids. Do you get new people from some time to time or or is it just the same people every week? Or Are you talking about volunteers? Oh, yeah, in terms of, you, no, sorry, I'm talking about the kids the themselves kids and themselves. keeping them open and, and yeah. does it grow? Or tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, I think it's a combination. I mean, we have the children who come who are there every week and it's yeah. great to see them and we have children who come who are new and we had a lot of new newer faces to me over over easter sure. particularly mm. and you know I, it's the exact same principle that applies with with adult ministry is you just want to make them feel welcome mm. you just want them you, you want to like go after the little lost sheep that's yeah. sitting off by themselves and doesn't want literally to talk to literally little anyone. literally <laughs> little you know and I, it's all about that personal connection i think mm. I, you know asking them questions and making them feel a little bit comfortable also reading reading the child some kids don't like to talk right that's a stressful thing to talk to an adult so just just like hanging out with them or saying let's just sit together or those sort of things so i think mm. it just really depends on mm. on the the person and and your intuition and knowing mm. what that child needs at that time. It's, it's funny. We take so much for granted. I know you guys recently did a, um, a, a webinar with our Divine Renovation Network, the coaching network on Kidsmen. And we take for granted just how, how normal the way we approach Kidsmen is. Because I'm, I'm listening to you speak, Kate, and I'm like, yeah, because we've got to focus on evangelization which isn't what most kids' ministries no. naturally have, right? No. So, like, for us, it's like, you're telling me, well, this is, you know, just like we would do at Alpha or any of the other, we want to make sure they feel welcome, that we've got, you know, that we, I, I love, and I, I think you started this, Father James, but I see Father Simon do it so well now uh, at every Mass. It's like, you know, that invitation to bring kids downstairs at the beginning of every Mass, assuming that there's a new person every time, mm -hmm. like, it is such, it's so smooth, so well done, and every time he says it, or, or when you're a guest, uh, when you're there uh, preaching and you do it, it's just like, it's amazing to hear, It's become right? part of the culture, It's part it? of the culture. But also there's yeah, a big always. ripple effect there too, right? Because if that child feels welcome downstairs, they're going to want to come back. And if yes. the child wants to come back, then who else is coming back? Parents, <laughs> Mom and right? dad, yeah, yeah. So there's there's totally a ripple effect there. Because if the child is like, oh, I hated that program. I don't want to go back to it. Mm -hmm. Then it's really a lot harder for mom and dad to convince those their children to come and and to be to try it again. And so yeah. that, that first time totally makes a difference. Just like in Alpha, right? Yeah, Same totally. Thing. And for those who are watching and, and listening, you know, we it's basically what we do is it's a because we plan out the central themes of our preaching in advance, we have time to create a, a, a kid's version of the same message so that the, the core message, you know, what do we want people to know? What do, we, what do we want them to do is somehow communicated to the kids at the same time as the adults are getting it upstairs. And 
And it's not a straight liturgical setting. Mm -hmm. we, we've moved to kind of a, a non-liturgical version of it to engage the kids. But they then the children are free to go upstairs uh, uh, for, for, for the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, and certainly those who have made their first communion or are preparing are, are definitely to go upstairs. But uh, other kids stay behind because maybe they're families that, that are just that are new to church that are themselves maybe these kids haven't even been baptized like so we're again it, it's reflective of of the the wonderful messiness that happens when you begin yeah. to establish a, a missionary culture in your parish where it's welcoming and you start to see people coming back who haven't gone through the regular rhythm or the routine they don't fit into the the tidy we, boxes that we often have a few weeks ago um we went we were at connect group laura and i my wife is laura who's the kids minister uh, so just make all those connections really fast. It's I'm a, a big fan. It's a smaller world than we th than you think. Uh, so so I was we were at Connect Group and this was on Sunday after after Mass and I can remember there's a couple of our Connect Group members asking Laura so you know how were the kids today kind of thing you know just that sort of interested but not really all that interested kind of question that you know, you know being polite if you will and Laura was like oh and really well and they're like well what, what did you say and Laura shared with them that the message that that she shared uh, with the kids and uh, anyway she she ended up at Connect Group more people were flocking around her like oh that's because it, it's so interesting it's exactly what we heard upstairs but it's like it's the same but different that's a, and they were just blown away. In fact, one of them said, you should go upstairs and give the homily one time because it's really interesting. <laughs> the illustration you're using is just brilliant. But that connectedness between what happens uh, yeah. for, for the adults and what happens for the kids, a lot of the time and intention goes into it. Mm -hmm. Well, in uh, fact, I think we said we were actually going to send the kids upstairs and we were going to go downstairs. <laughs> 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 we'll be up for you, Chris Father. <laughs> Take care of these guys, will you? <laughs> oh, it's very cool. So, Kate, how did you get involved? So, you, when you started at St. Benedict, uh, like, how did you was there a, was there a call? Did you was it networking? How did you end up getting into a, to a ministry role at St. Benedict? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, um, I kind of just did it myself, to be honest. I found out who Laura was, and I, I really prayed because I have a music degree. I pray my prayer was, okay, Lord, do you want me to to use my gifts with music, or is is there somewhere else that you're calling me to? And I really felt a strong call uh, to kids ministry. I love mm. children. I have a passion to work with them, and um, and I really felt that I too, I needed a bit of a break from music and um, I, yeah, I, so when it was funny cause when I reached out for her, reached out to Laura, I, uh, I sent her an email uh, and a Facebook message cause I'm a, I'm a keener <laughs> and, uh, and just kind of said awesome. like, look, I'm around, this is my background. Uh, I had worked in parish ministry before as a family life and faith formation coordinator previously. So I had a little bit of experience in that area and I just said that, like, is there any where that you need help with anything? You know, I'm here, and you you, you know that you are the dream person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, like, <laughs> that's the that's the that's the email that you want to print and frame on your wall. But the funny part about it was that when we met for coffee, she said, "Okay, I just have to tell you, the, my prayer for the last month has been, you need to send me, Lord, you need to send me someone." So it was just it was a wow. really divine matchup, mm -hmm. I think. And I've just loved working with Laura. Like she's become a good friend of mine and I love what she's doing with kids ministry. I love how bold she is and brave. It's, it's like, I it's know. hard to, to, to make new territory. And, um, I think she's doing a great job and I'm just happy to support her in whatever way I can, whether that's putting on a night costume and acting out a skin. <laughs> I, was, I was picturing right. you actually in the night costume. There was this moment where Kate was all dressed up like a knight and you were riding on something. Did you have like a, a horse or, Groom no, or? A, a, a fictional horse? A fictional like, horse. I remember you galloping around as a knight uh, yeah. one day. It was, it was quite something to yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. Any, anything for the children. <laughs> <laughs> Must be musical theater. Yeah. Well, that's what the, the Lord like. has brought you back to. Well, it's also so cool, right? That I can be working and doing skits for the kids, and mm -hmm. so like that's so awesome, right? Like it's all my gifts, all my like loves in life. It's great. Maybe you'll awesome. dress up as a nun for one the of them. Dream. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Well, one of the amazing things is that we're, we're seeing that ministry grow because of your involvement, because of the other people who are involved in it, and we've seen that ministry double and then more than double uh, just in the last year, and so. 
it, it's been tremendously fruitful. So I think we're also grateful for what you bring to it. But Kate, I wanted to thank you for, for being with us today. It was amazing to hear parts of your story. And I'm so grateful for what you do at St. Benedict Parish. Um, for those of you joining us, uh, if you want to learn more about Divine Renovation, check us out at divinerenovation.net. And we also have uh, the next two events are the May 9th event in London. Uh, there's there's less than 100 tickets left at that one. So we'd love for you to join Father James, uh, myself, and some others from the team in London on May the 9th. You can get tickets at divinerenovation.net. And our, Halif- our Halifax conference, the one that's going to be right here in town, uh, there's not many tickets left at all for that. I don't know. Uh, 60 tickets, I think, out of six, 650. So it'll be gone. So. They'll be gone very soon. So uh, hopefully you'll, you'll choose to join us here. Uh, there's people coming from all over the world, the Philippines, Malaysia. Um, um, Scotland. I, it's, it's, there's like 13 <laughs> something countries i think at this point yeah <laughs> five minutes away anyway so coming from all over uh so hopefully you'll join us here at, at that conference if you and if you're feeling motivated to act fast uh and also I, I think ron you mentioned earlier the divine renovation association we just launched it uh, I, i'm hoping you'll at least feel inspired to check it out there's a cool little overview video on our website so go to divine and if you go under get equipped because it's all about equipping you as as a leader so if you go under the get equipped section of our website you'll see the divine renovation association i encourage you to check that out. But thanks so much for joining us and God bless.